What's up? Welcome to the stream, everybody. I am Lauren Schaefer, and I'm here with Ken Alger. Hey, everyone. Greetings from uh, Scorching Hot Oregon. Yeah, where? Tell us, tell us where you're from. Uh, so, Ken, how hot is Scorching Hot Oregon? Um, it's supposed to get up to 109 degrees Fahrenheit here over the weekend, which um, is about uh, 42, 43 Celsius, which um, is wow. warm. What about you? Where are you? Where are you currently located? In your bunker in uh, Antarctica? That would be nice. Um, no, uh, I would love to be traveling internationally right now, but I am here in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's been warm, you know, the last couple of weeks, but we've got a beautiful, pleasant day. It's 67 degrees Fahrenheit here, and I'm not so good with the conversion, but that is beautiful, pleasant Celsius. Yeah, that's, no, that's nice. Yeah. Cool. So let's see. Can we get started here, Lauren? Let's get started. Oh, okay. Well, first, Luce is here. Hey, Luce. Ken, I don't know if you've had a chance to meet Luce, but she is brand new on our team. And oh, nice. uh, it looks like she's come up calling in from Manchester today. 59 degrees. Beautiful. I'll take that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I think let's let's jump on in. You're you're excited to get going, huh? Oh yeah. Always yeah. It's always a pleasure to work with you on these. Of course. All right, so today we're going to be talking about MongoDB, right? Okay, we're going to give an intro to MongoDB. If you're a developer, you are in the right spot. We're going to give you a high-level look. We're going to start out by talking about terms and concepts uh, and how we model data in MongoDB. And then Ken's going to cover the MongoDB data platform. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to wrap things up with a demo so you can see what Ken talks about in action. And apparently, Ken is very pumped about talking about the data platform. Absolutely. Absolutely. Why not? Hey, Joe. Hey, Poke Trainer. Glad you guys are here. All right. Let's get started with terms and concepts. So we're going to start things off with documents. And no, we're, we're not talking about Word documents. No? And no. I feel like... Back in the day, you may have been a fan of Clippy. Were you a Clippy fan? Um, not necessarily a fan, but certainly was uh, active in Word when Clippy was popular. Just wanted to swat him away. Yeah. 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 All right. So we're not talking about Word documents. We are talking about JSON documents. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. So if you've used any of the C family of programming languages, we can just rattle those off. Things like C, C Sharp, Go, Java, JavaScript, PHP, or Python. Documents are probably going to feel pretty comfortable to you. So documents typically store information about one object, as well as any information directly related to that object. So every document begins and ends with curly braces. And inside of those curly braces are field value pairs. So the great thing about documents is they can be incredibly rich. Values can be a variety of types, including strings, numbers, arrays, dates, timestamps, or even objects. So Other you know, objects can live inside an object? I know. It's crazy, right? That's nuts, but awesome. It's nuts. Totally awesome. You'll see an example of that in just a second. So... When people talk about MongoDB, they'll often use the term non-relational, um, but that doesn't mean MongoDB doesn't store relationships. Uh, that was a little confusing. MongoDB stores relationships really well. It's just different than the way relational databases do. Oh my gosh, Lou says there's a Clippy statue on the Microsoft campus in Seattle. Uh, wow, that is that is dedication. I don't know. I do. I feel like maybe we should have a leaf, leafy statue at MongoDB in New York, like in the plaza at the bottom yeah. of the of the building. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that'd be pretty cool. I would love that. Hey, so glad everybody is here. All right, we got a question. Uh, do they use primary keys? 
So documents uh, have unique object IDs. So you'll see, let me see if my next example has one. No, I'm trying to move forward on the screen. That's not going to work. <laughs> um, there's Leslie. Um, I'll show you what an underscore ID is in just a moment. Uh, but basically, it's a unique identifier. All right, back to the slides. So let's walk through an example of how you would model the same data in a relational tabular database versus MongoDB. So let's say we need to store information about a user named Leslie. Ah, I know. Oh, it's so no. Are we going back through the Parks and Rec references? Of course. Have you um, watched? Have you watched any yet? No. Okay. This is very disappointing. I feel like you've had plenty of time to watch. Oh, I have, quarantine. but now it's like an intentional thing that every time we talk, I can say no, I still haven't watched it. That's so rude. <laughs> Everybody give Ken crap in the comments about how lame that is that he's intentionally not watching Parks and Rec. Which according to Lauren is the best show ever. Best show ever. It It's just, it makes you happy. Sometimes you just need to watch something and feel happy, and that's what Parks and Rec is. All right, anyway, so we're gonna model data about Leslie, and let's kick things off with her contact information. In a relational database, we'll create a table named users. So we can create columns for each piece of contact information that we need to store. First name, last name, cell phone number, and city. To ensure we've got a unique way to identify each row, we'll include an ID column. All right, and um, I'm just gonna quick shout out for Shiri. So Shiri is uh, a MongoDB employee who's also a MySQL expert. Like back in the day, she like ran user groups and she knows all things. So if you have questions about how um, no, our relational databases relate to MongoDB, you can drop those in the chat and Shiri is in the background, rapid firing answers. So um, feel free to ask those questions there. All right, I'm just gonna keep jumping in and out of the slides. Okay, so we've got Leslie's information in tables. Now let's talk about documents. Uh, we can create a new document for Leslie where we'll add field value pairs for each piece of contact information we need to store. So as you can see, we've That's got field value. Are you, I can't tell if you're being serious or not. No, it, it does. Like the document seems a lot easier to read and parse through than a big, huge table. Yeah, it is. It's nice. It's condensed. It's very easy to read. So here's the underscore ID I was talking about just a minute ago, right up here at the top. So we're going to use underscore ID to uniquely identify each document. And we'll store this document in a collection named users. So now that we've stored her contact information, let's store the coordinates of her current location. When using a relational database, we'll need to split the latitude and longitude between two columns. Now, MongoDB supports arrays, so we can store the latitude and longitude together in a single field, and we can call that field location. So now we're successfully storing Leslie's contact information and current location. Now let's talk about how to store her hobbies. What kind of hobbies do you think Leslie has, Ken? Um, less than zero idea because I don't watch the show. <laughs> this is very disappointing. All right. So oh, scrapbooking, like eating scrapbook. waffles, and working. Obviously. So a single user could have many hobbies, right? We're going to represent a one-to-many relationship. What we're probably going to do is create a separate table just for hobbies. Each row in the table will contain information about one hobby for one user. When we need to retrieve Leslie's hobbies, we'll join the users table and our new hobbies table together. That seems expensive. All right. It does seem expensive. Like, like you need to go to like buy a new handbag expensive or what do you mean, Ken? Oh, just like it's a lot of work for the computer to join things together and parse all that. Yeah. yeah, and it's probably not gonna be that expensive here in this example, right? But when you get 
a lot, you know, a lot of tables with a lot of data, it does get really expensive. All right, so let's talk about the MongoDB side now. So MongoDB supports arrays. We can simply add a new field named hobbies to our existing document for Leslie. The array can contain as many or as few hobbies as we need. When we need to retrieve Leslie's hobbies, we don't need to do that expensive join to bring the data together. We can simply retrieve the single document in the user's collection. So what do you think, less expensive? Uh, less expensive and um, again, much easier to read. Mm -hmm. All right, let's say we also need to store Leslie's job history. So just as we did with hobbies, we're likely to create a separate table just for that job history information. Each row in the table will contain information about one job for one user. So far, we've used arrays to store geolocation data and a list of strings, but arrays can contain values of any type, including objects. So let's create an object for each job Leslie has held and store those objects in an array. So as you can see, we've got a job history field that stores an array. And inside of that array, we have an object for when she was the deputy director, an object for when she was a city councilor, and an object for when she was director of the National Park Service's Midwest branch. That's very wordy. That's a long title on your business card. It is. Or if business right. cards are still a thing these days. I, you know what, I got out my uh, laptop backpack this weekend and I found my business cards in there and they're outdated. And I was like, I don't even know when I'm gonna need to use these again. Like, <laughs> it's bizarre. We've been grounded for so long. One day. Someday, All right. someday soon. Someday, someday. So now we've decided how we'll store information about our users in both tables and documents. Let's store information about Ron. So Ron's gonna have almost all the same information as Leslie. However, Ron does his best to stay kind of off the grid. So he will not be storing his location in the system. So let's begin by examining how we would store Ron's information in the same tables that we used for Leslie's. When using a relational database, we are required to input a value for every cell in the table. We'll represent Ron's lack of location data with null. Now the problem with using null is that it's unclear whether the data does not exist or the data is just unknown. So many people will discourage the use of null. In MongoDB, we have the option of representing Ron's lack of location data in two ways. We can either omit the location field from the document or we can set location to null. Best practices suggest that we omit the location field to save space. So you can choose if you want omitted fields and fields set to null to represent different things in your applications. All right, so Ron has some hobbies and job history, so we'll add his information to those tables. And we can add that information to his document as well. So at this point, the structure of Ron's document looks pretty similar to Leslie's. Now let's say we're feeling pretty good about this, right? What do you think, Ken? Should we launch our app? We're feeling good? Um, we could do that. Okay, yeah, just agree with me. Very good. Then we discover- I've we need learned that that's the, best, that's the best approach just in general. I agree with Lauren. I agree. I don't know why everyone else doesn't follow that approach though. All right, so Ken agrees. We're gonna launch our app. We feel good about it. Let's let's uh, let's launch this MVP. Okay, so things are rolling, and then we discover we need to store information about a new user named Lauren Burhug. Now, Lauren is a fourth grade student who Ron teaches about government. We need to store a lot of the same information about Lauren as we did with Leslie and Ron, right? Things like her first name, last name, city, and hobbies. However. Lauren does not have a cell phone, location data, or job history. And then we Doesn't discover we get a store. In fourth grade? No. And I I stand by this. I don't do fourth graders really need cell phones? Is need that no. I mean, my daughter's school and my wife's um, school where she teaches or where she taught at kindergarten, um, 
there were kindergartners with iPhones, which I found a little reprehensible, but that's just me. Oh my gosh. I saw that there are now like smart watches you can buy for your kids so they can like have just call you on it. And I was like, even that, I was like, I don't know. Can we just put that off for <laughs> many more years? A few more months and then you're going to have to get, uh, oh. get one of those. I don't know. I'm not ready for that. <laughs> All right. Okay. So back okay. to, uh, back to the fourth grade here. Back to the fourth grader. Okay. So now we're storing information about a fourth grader and we discover requirements change. We need to store a new piece of information. We need to know what school she attends. Done, done, done. Right. How are we going to do that? How are we going to deal with the requirements changing? All right. So let's start out, do the easy stuff. Let's talk about how to store Lauren's information in the tables as they already exist. Okay. That's, that feels okay. Still nulls though. Don't like those things, but that's Still all right. Nulls. Yeah. All right. And then we can create a new document for Lauren and include the data that we have for her in it. So that feels okay. All right. Let's talk about how to store information about Lauren's school in our tables. We've got two options. We can choose to add a column to the existing users table, or we can create a new table named schools. So let's say we choose to add a column named school to the users table. Depending on our access rights to the database, we may need to talk to the DBA and convince them to add the column, right? Maybe we have to do a little begging. Maybe we have to do a little bribing. Maybe we bring our DBA their favorite donut. Or maybe we bring our manager along to pressure the DBA into agreeing. Ken, you're, you're a manager now. Do people bring you along to get stuff done? Um, sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it has to happen. All right. So let's say we get the DBA to agree. The database is likely going to need to be taken down. The school column will need to be added. No values will be stored in every row in the user's table where a user does not have a school. And then the database will need to be brought back up. Right, it's very doable, but it could be a little painful. All right, and let's talk about how to get the DBA to agree to it. Right, sometimes they're sticklers. Oh, Sherry, okay, I've I've been uh, not reading a lot of the comments, but Sherry says alter table makes DBAs cry. Exactly. Yep. All right, so how are we going to do this in MongoDB? Ken, what do you think? Um, I, I'd say we just add a, another field in the JSON document there. And since we have kind of a flexible model, you know, Lauren doesn't have to have all the same exact fields as Ron and Leslie do and vice versa. I totally agree with you, Ken. We are on the same page. Yeah. We just add the new school field. Now, you know, some of you might be going, oh my gosh, right? You can't just add a field, right? What is this flexible schema? Um, I know I started to panic a little when I was introduced to the idea. I remember that. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I probably did call you up. Ken, I don't feel good about this. This is bad, <laughs> right? But this flexibility can be hugely valuable as your application's requirements evolve and change. Also, MongoDB provides schema validation, so you can actually lock down your schema as much or as little as you'd like when you're ready. I think, Ken, you've, you've written some blog posts about this, about how to set up that schema validation. Yes, okay. I have, um, and I can, I don't know that I have um, the ability to put things into the comments, but um, we'll get a link there for the schema validation blog post series. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna pause for a second because I'm I'm uh, seeing we've got a lot of comments in here. Looks like Sherry has been answering uh, a lot of questions, which I love. Um, let's see. Maker of Adventures asks, how do I get a job in MongoDB DevRel? This looks awesome fun. This is awesome fun. Or as <laughs> Nick would say, this is dope, right? Okay. Uh, I, I don't know if we're hiring right now, but if we do have open positions, they would be on our career site, which I do not have the URL to offhand. MongoDB.com um, slash careers. Okay. Way to, way to be there. Way to be a manager, Ken. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
But um, I know we are hiring for uh, the the big dog in in Deverell, um, the VP. the VP. Yeah, so that's open. So yeah, we'd love to have you join our team. Hello, hello, Gabriel. Good to see you. I love with them when we get a worldwide audience. All right. Um, I'm going to keep going. Here we go. I can't read the chat. I love that you all are uh, chatting so much, but I can't read it and talk at the same time. Hey, Lucas, glad to have you here. Here we go. All right. So now that we're starting to get the idea of how tables and documents are similar and different, let's do some explicit term mapping. On the left side of the screen, you'll see tabular or relational database terms. And on the right side of the screen, you're going to see MongoDB terms. So first up, we saw this a bit in our earlier example, a row maps to a document. Or depending on how you've normalized your data, rows from multiple tables could map to a single document. A column maps roughly to a field. Now in a relational database, groups of rows are stored in tables. In MongoDB, groups of documents are stored in collections. So tables map to collections. The next few terms are probably going to feel pretty comfortable to those of you with relational database backgrounds, as the terminology is basically the same between the two. Just like you store groups of tables in a relational database, you store groups of collections in a MongoDB database. Indexes are fairly similar between the two. Indexes help speed up your read queries. Views are pretty similar in both. Now, there are a few different ways to handle joins in MongoDB. The general recommendation is that if you have related information that you would put in a separate table in a relational database, you should embed that information in a single document when working in MongoDB. So the rule of thumb, and I say it all the time to people, is that data that is accessed together should be stored together. So if you'll be frequently accessing information together that you would have put in separate tables, you should likely just embed it in a document. Now, there are a few other options for joins as well. MongoDB supports references between the documents, similar to how you would use a foreign key. And MongoDB also has an operation called $lookup to support a left outer join. So I'm not going to go any deeper into those today, but I just want you to know that it is possible to join data from more than one collection in MongoDB if you really need to. All right, last term for you today. Let's talk about ACID transactions. Transactions group database operations together so they either all succeed or none succeed. Now, if you did some research online about relational databases versus NoSQL databases before coming here today, you probably saw something about NoSQL databases not supporting transactions as this huge major drawback. I mean, if you care about data integrity, right? And who doesn't? That's a pretty scary sounding drawback. Now, some NoSQL databases support ACID transactions while others do not. In relational databases, we call these multi-record ACID transactions. Um, MongoDB does support transactions and we call them multi-document ACID transactions. However, when you model your data from MongoDB, you'll find that most of the time you don't actually need to use a transaction. All right, so to wrap up this section before I hand everything over to Ken, uh, I created this term mapping summary for you. And it's a lot of information, but you can take a screenshot, you can tweet it, you could print it out and hang it up at your desk if people even have printers anymore, um, whatever you need to do. But can you probably own a printer, don't you? Uh, yeah. Yeah. My, my kids actually have to turn in paper projects, like typed up, printed things at times. Yeah. So we have to have a printer. Yeah. I've heard that it's, yeah. The cool kids, I don't think have them anymore. I have one. All right, before we go on, I wanna make sure I wanna emphasize those first three term mappings. A row maps to a document, a column maps to a field, and a table maps to a collection. All right, um, so Ken, 
Yo. I'm going to pass it over to you because you were so pumped to talk about the data platform. Awesome. Thanks, Lauren. You're so welcome. All right. So I think you're still in charge of the, the clicking of the, the deck. So I have to pay attention. OK, I'm ready. Yep. Sorry, no naps for you. OK. So, you know, so far we've talked a little bit about NoSQL, document databases, and focused on MongoDB specifically and comparing that back to traditional relational databases. We've covered a range of aspects related to writing and designing applications for MongoDB and how you might think about a, at least a little bit of how you might um, structure your, your data and your documents. However, MongoDB is not just a database product, product, it's a complete ecosystem. And we'd like to refer to it as a data platform, which really consists of a number of different tools. And we'll cover some of these in relationship to, our, uh, to the MongoDB ecosystem. There's kind of three different aspects of a data platform that we'll look at here. Um, and it's related to storing the data, accessing the data, and processing the data. And these will help show the range and usefulness of the tooling ecosystem within MongoDB. We'll discuss some tools like Atlas and Compass, Charts, Data Lake, and a few others that are part of our data platform. All right, and I think that's my cue. And uh, let's see, Jose is asking if the slides are available to download. Yes, they are. I will drop a link while Ken keeps chatting. Awesome, thank you. Now, first of all, we need to store the data someplace, right? I mean, that's what a database is. You need to store it. Um, and so you'll need to do a database installation in some way, shape, or form. So that can either be self-managed or run in MongoDB's um, service, MongoDB Atlas. So self-managed simply means that you're going to have the data on your laptop as part of your development environment, um, host it on your own server, your mainframe, in a public cloud provider, any of those sorts of things. If you're going to go take that approach to having a database, we highly recommend you use Ops Manager to manage, monitor, and backup um, your data in those environments. MongoDB Atlas is MongoDB's database as a service. And this is where MongoDB will manage and automate your deployment in one or many public cloud providers. Right now, our cloud providers are Amazon's AWS, Microsoft's Azure, or Google's Cloud Platform. And MongoDB and our teams here will manage and maintain your databases from a you know operational standpoint. And all of the same tooling and features available in Ops Manager are also available in Atlas, which makes it really convenient. Yeah, and I just want to add in, like, I, I work for a database company and like, I hate managing a database. Like I, I never go and set everything up manually. I always do it in Atlas because I don't know, you haven't set out. Did you say Atlas yet? Yeah. I should listen better. Yeah, but I want to go in and I just want to spin up a database. I, I, I just want somebody else to take care of it for me. Like I, I hate managing databases. Yeah, so. I mean like, not, nothing against DBAs and, and folks that do that. They're great, they're brilliant and all that. But as a developer, oh, yeah. the last thing I want to do is go in and worry about how much memory needs to be allocated to my database, um, whether it needs to be like how that physically needs to be replicated and sharded and all that sort of thing. If I ever get to that point, I just want to, like you said, go in, start something, save data, access the data and be done. Yeah, so much easier. All right, so you know, if we look at uh, the first aspect of how MongoDB is a data platform and specifically how data is stored, um, within our data platform, we have MongoDB Atlas, which is our database as a service. And it's always gonna be running the latest version of MongoDB, which ensures that you, know, you can avail all the new features and upgrades of, of the various versions. And it's all those upgrades are handled automatically by MongoDB Atlas and our team here. So it can be hosted on any of the big three providers, like I mentioned, AWS, Azure, GCP. Um, and this I think is really cool. We also recently, I mean, it's been a while now, but relatively recently announced support for multi-cloud support. So you can put the same application data into multiple cloud providers and to allow you to take advantage of the services that 
the different cloud providers offer, and also you, you increase resiliency in your application. So Atlas isn't just a database by itself. It's not just MongoDB database, you know, the, the core database in the cloud. Um, it's really a key element of our entire data platform. So it supports and runs other tools such as Atlas Search, which utilizes Apache's Lucene to provide a really fine grained text search, um, full text search queries using the, the MongoDB query language, MQL. We have things in Atlas like charts. We have things like Atlas Data Lake, which provides storage on Amazon's S3 and can be configured with auto archi archiving, um, you know, to allow you to move older data or data which isn't relevant anymore to your operational workload. You can offload that to the cheaper storage that S3 provides. And while it's over there on S3, it can still be queried using the MongoDB query language, MQL. So let's take a just a real quick look at um, and talk a little bit about Atlas Data Lake a little bit more in depth here. And when Ken's done, I'm going to show you how you can actually query uh, your data lake, which is very cool. So that's coming. Yeah. Up. So the, the demo is coming. It's it's really exciting, but we're just going to kind of talk here real quick about some of these things. So data lakes are increasingly becoming more common, right? It's a a centralized storage point for your data, whether structured or unstructured. In the case of Atlas Data Lake, that centralized storage is on um, Amazon Simple Storage Service or S3. And we support a variety of file formats like JSON, BSON, CSV, and several others. And these can be queried using the same query language, like I mentioned, MQL, um, that you'd use across your entire MongoDB database. And you can do that with Mongo Shell, MongoDB Compass, a driver for your application. Um, you know, however, you're gonna access your, your data initially um, or already, it can also be used in Atlas Data Lake. And the queries don't trigger data movement or transformation, transformation um, of the data. They're, they're actually performed against the data sitting on S3, which, saves a bunch of money in data transfer times. So within the data platform, you're able to configure rules. And in Atlas, the rules can be configured to trigger the um, you know, automatic tiering or archiving of data from Atlas to the Atlas data lake. And this can move data targeted by the rules. And so um, you know, typically it's gonna be older data, infrequently accessed data, and move that from an Atlas cluster over to Atlas Data Lake on S3 without really requiring any user action outside of setting up the rules initially. And this will allow a unified view of both your Atlas, your MongoDB Atlas data and the data sitting on the Atlas Data Lake. And again, hold on and we'll see a little bit of a demo for that here in just a minute. Um, so second aspect of data platform is accessing the data. Um, kind of what good is having data stored someplace if you can't access it. So one really cool thing within our data platform is workload isolation. And this allows you to run operational workloads along with analytical workloads on the same platform, which is a big advantage as it means you don't need to provision a separate database or separate set of resources to service your analytical queries. So this can be done by designating a specific set of nodes within your MongoDB Atlas clusters to be read only and which will service the analytical queries. So for example here, MongoDB Atlas can provide one set of nodes which are focused on servicing your main traffic, your operational operations and applications. And these nodes continue to replicate the changes or updates to a second set of nodes. The second set of nodes could serve your analytical queries. Your application can target through which of the two sets of nodes should sure should excuse me should service the request depending on boy it's um, long story but it's it's been a rough week <laughs> um, uh, so kind of depending on the purpose of the request you can target which set of nodes you're going to and we appreciate you being here despite your rough week yeah and it's it, powering through right now. 
There we go. Um, so change streams um, is another kind of really cool aspect of accessing data within MongoDB. It provides a mechanism for applications to subscribe to changes, whether on a single collection, a database, or over an entire deployment. Um, these are streaming as they happen to the application, so it can react to them immediately. So real-time changes, right, occur in a whole wide variety of applications. Business applications, user data, sensor data, click stream data. So change streams and specifically our change stream API allow for applications to access and consume these real-time event notifications and they're not just limited to your application as they underpin a number of other tools in the wider MongoDB ecosystem and data platform. We utilize the aggregation framework, so it allows for additional filtering or transformations to be applied to the changes as they're sent out. The so business apps such as MongoDB charts can use change streams as a data source, which can additionally be used with the charts embedded SDK to include functionality of both of these features into your application. Um, it, I mean, it, and they're really used across a lot of things. Atlas triggers, our Kafka connector utilizes change streams, and it allows for reactivity to be built into your applications. So any changes that are made in the data can be pushed from MongoDB to your application, rather than your application having to regularly pull the database with additional queries to determine if there were any changes in terms of data uh, since the last time it checked. Yeah, I got to do a hackathon, I don't know, a couple months ago where we got to build anything we wanted with MongoDB and I got to really play around with change streams and it's really fun like to take action based, you know, when something happens in your database, you automatically take an action. It's very cool. You can build some really cool things. So if you want to just play around with MongoDB and like build something fun, I definitely recommend chain streams and triggers. because Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, like, like a, a simple thing that comes to my mind, right, is like as inventory comes back in stock, you set up a chain stream that then sends out a notification to, to somebody to do something. You know, they get a text message, they get an email, phone call, whatever. But it, it can be really powerful. Just I mean, that's just one simple example. Yeah. All right. So how do we do all this? Right, we you know we we leverage MQL, and I've mentioned this a few times. It's the MongoDB query language, and it's um, really tailored for MongoDB and our document model. It allows for very high performance queries in a syntax that is, I think, very readable and easy to use. Um, and we can look at a real quick example here. So if we look at the syntax here, we're specifying a database called inventory. Um, well, the inventory collection within the database. And we're issuing a find command and passing in an empty document here into our query filter. So this syntax here kind of corresponds to the select star from inventory statement in a, you know, a relational SQL language. So now if we want to find, for example, an inventory item with a name of typewriter, we could pass that into the query per parameter here. So MongoDB- hey, writer, query... how, how old are you, Ken? Uh, typewriter? No comment. And, and yes, I do have an actual manual, like non-electric typewriter as well. Wow, printers, um, typewriters. Give a record I'm player. trying to figure out how to hook that up to the internet, but it, there isn't a port for it on the, on the typewriter. So um, anyway, you know, MQL provides this rich query language, provides support for all your, your CRUD operations, create, read, update, delete, um, text search, geospatial queries, and so much more. It's, it's really a very powerful um, approach to finding things and, Again, um, I find it a lot easier to read than a lot of SQL statements. Um, not that there's, you know, I mean, SQL is a learned language, so you can parse through it. But I find, personally, I find MQL a little bit easier to follow through as you're just reading it and understanding it. 
So let's now look at how some of the tools that we have that can be used to process data. Um, the first tool within our data platform is Data Compass for processing data. And this is really, um, uh, I actually, Joel, I no longer have an 8-track player um, because I can't find tapes for it. And A and B, as Lauren knows, I really don't listen to music a whole lot anyway, so. That's a shame. Yeah. We do need to get you more into music. Are there any other Taylor Swift fans out there? Shout out. I don't know. Does Becky she have Swift. stuff on eight track tapes? That might get me there. No, probably not. Yeah. Um, all right. So, you know, Compass here allows you to visually explore your data. It's, it's really powerful. You can do CRUD operations. You can there's a query builder in there. There's a schema analyzer. It's really a great tool um, for going in and looking at your, your data. It's really pretty powerful. Um, yeah, it's really, and it's also one of the best way to identify schemas um, for a given data set and, right? Because it will split out and say, hey, this field is predominantly um, string based and here's what the, values are and here's what the percentages are. It's, it's really a great tool. The next tool that we have for data processing um, within our data platform is MongoDB Charts. It's an analytical tool. It's um, specifically designed for the document model, which provides additional flexibility when compared to using analytical tools designed for relational models, you know, and kind of shoehorning that into MongoDB data. Um, MongoDB charts provides a wide variety of chart types, um, not only common chart types like bar and column and line, but you can get geospatial heat maps, scatter plots, um, which can be great for visualizing location data. MongoDB charts is hosted within the MongoDB Atlas infrastructure. You can use the charts developed by MongoDB charts and embed them into external documents or web pages. You can share them via links. And there's a lot more to MongoDB charts. And if you're interested in it, in you know charts in general, and the fastest and easiest way to visualize your MongoDB data, um, I'd encourage you to take a look at it. And actually, MongoDB University just recently released an introduction to MongoDB charts course. And that would be a really great place to start that journey. Oh, I need to check that out. I haven't gotten to that yet. That sounds nice. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty great. So the last tool that we'll we'll cover here for processing data is our business intelligence connector, BI connector for short, and it really allows you to um, use complex data visualization packages and tools such as Tableau or ClickSense um, and a whole host of others, um, and it allows you to use these third-party charting tools as a with you know their SQL shell, so they can issue SQL queries and receive results from them. Um, and the BI connector kind of acts as that translation layer that allows for SQL queries to be made against MongoDB collections and sort out the arrays and the sub documents and all that sort of thing. So kind of wrapping up here, and I know we're um, everybody's excited to go see the demo that Lauren has here. So concepts for uh, the data platform, storing the data, we have self-managed Atlas, Atlas Data Lake, um, accessing the data because again, what good is storing it if you can't access it? So features such as workload isolation, chain streams, MQL, um, all allow you to access the data. And some of the tools that we have for processing the data and really getting a better visual um, handle on the data or things like MongoDB Compass, MongoDB Charts, and our BI connector. All right, Lauren, I think you are up to your demo time here. Um, it's demo I don't know. time. Yeah, demo time. Um, hold on, everybody. There's something a little fishy about her demo, but it's all right. I had to get one in. Come on. Come on. I say you've been pretty tame today. There's not been as many uh, dad jokes today. All right. So this is why it's fishy. We're talking about 
OFISH. So OFISH stands for Officer Fisheries Information Sharing Hub. OFISH is much easier to say. So Wild Aid is an organization that works to protect vulnerable marine environments. So MongoDB built a mobile app for Wild Aid last year, and the app is called OFISH, which is what you see on the screen. So the goal of the OFISH app is to make it easy for officers who are boarding fishing vessels to easily store the information they gather while on the vessel. So when the officers board the vessels, they're checking for any sort of fishing violations. Now, before the app existed, officers were recording information with pen and paper while they were on the boat and then transferring that information to a digital copy, digital copy when they were back on land. So now they can use the OFISH mobile app while on the boats, regardless of whether or not they have internet. So let's take a look at the web app version. And awkward transition. Let's see. Nope, I opened a new tab, so that, that didn't work. Let's try again. Ken, tell a bad joke while I'm uh, transitioning here. Oh, I don't tell bad jokes, Lauren. Okay. Nobody believes that. <laughs> okay, so do you, do you know where I store all my dad jokes, Lauren? Where, Ken? In my database. Mm, so bad. So bad. Okay, moving on from that. All right, so this is the web app for OFISH. Now I want to search for a crew mem crew member named Van. And okay, well I typed can, but that's okay um, because MongoDB knew what I meant. So I'm going to go ahead and see all results for can. Um, now I'm looking for a crew member, so I'm going to click see all on captains and crew. Now it might be hard to see, um, but in bold are the words that matched. Can. So we've got van, we've got fan, some more vans, lots of vans here, and a cap all the way down at the bottom. Um, I'm actually yeah, the looking captain. the yes. captain. Are you the captain? No. Okay. No. no. All right. We're looking for van. I think we found him here. Let's take a look. So here we can see all of the detailed information about van. So the nice thing here is that the app does not have to use any sort of third-party search technology to get this to work. The search is done completely in MongoDB. So let me show you how this works. I'm going to jump over to Atlas. And remember, Ken talked about Atlas early, earlier. Atlas is our database as a service. So inside of Atlas, you can see we've got a database named WildAid. It's got a bunch of collections in it, and I'm here inside of the boarding reports collection. This collection has 3,000 documents in it. I can expand one of them, and you can see all of this information that's being stored in this particular document. So you can see the variety of types that we talked about earlier, right? We've got strings, we've the got name object. Of that so is it the Wandering Comet? Yeah, that's awesome. Very good. Is that a reference to something, or just you just like it? I just I just like it. It's out of this world. Oh, okay. I knew there had to be a reason. Okay. All right. We're going to talk about full text search now. So what I'm going to do is click on the search tab. No. Okay. Pretend that didn't happen. Let's try again. Why is it doing that, Ken? Because it's a live demo. demo. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll just refresh the page. It has been sitting here for a while. I'm going to hope that was the problem. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, okay, Woo. there we go. So here you can see I've got a search index that I created. Uh, actually, someone else might have created this one. But here's a search index. It's got the default settings dynamically mapping every field in the collection so that when we do that full text search, we can do it across all of our fields. Now, right now, the default search index works just fine for our current application because we only have a few thousand records. But for a larger application, or when specific sets of fields are used more than others, mapping to these specific fields is beneficial. So once this index is configured right here, 
then I can use the dollar search operation to take advantage of full text search in my application. So not too bad to set that up. All right, now I'm gonna jump back to OFISH and I've opened up one of the dashboards. So here I'm in the Wild A dashboard and there are a variety of charts here, right? I've got like some quick stats. I've got a donut chart. I've even got an interactive donut. map. What's your favorite kind of donut, Ken? Chocolate. Chocolate. I like and the Boston cream. Yeah, those are good too. It's still early here on the West Coast, so donuts are still a, a viable food source. I think you can eat donuts all day long. I'm I'm perfectly fine with that. There's no judgment here. All right, so we've also got a table down here. So we've got all these different charts, right? Um, now, in a previous life, my job was to actually create dashboards like this using D3, and it was a pretty tedious process. The charts you see here are all generated using MongoDB charts, no programming required. So I'm gonna jump back to the cloud. And here you can see I've opened up charts and I'm viewing my dashboard. Here are the charts that you just saw embedded in my application. They're just um, you know in a different, different layout, but it's the same charts. So you can choose to embed charts. It's pretty easy with the click of a button. You can choose to embed the chart using uh, an iframe, or if you want to go a little more, a little deeper, get a little more configuration, you can use the embedding SDK. So you got a lot of flexibility there. If you want to edit a chart, you can come over and click the edit button. And once this loads, I'll be able to make all sorts of changes to my chart. So let's say I want to display my data in a different way. I can just change my chart type, maybe change it to a gauge. I don't particularly like this color of red. So I could come in and I could say, instead of red, I want it to be pink, right? Pretty simple. Everything's pink so, with Lauren. If she has know, mouth, like the, pink. I know, isn't our background super cute with the pink background? Yeah. All right, so one more thing to demo for you. I wanna talk about Atlas Data Lake and Online Archive. So Ken talked about Data Lake earlier. And Online Archive is a really handy feature that you can leverage as part of Atlas Data Lake. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna just open up a different Atlas cluster to show off op, to show off Online Archive. There we go. So the sample data we have here is from an organization called Sail Drone, whose fleet of drones are equipped with atmospheric and oceanographic sensors. Now, Sail Drone's mission is to create the highest resolution ocean data set in the world and use it to make global processes such as weather forecasting, carbon cycling, global fishing, and climate change more predictable, visible, and actionable. That's a big mission. Um, they actually have a lot of data here, data going all the way back to January of 2019. Now, we know this older data is not going to change, so we can archive it. When we archive data in the data lake, we're going to pay less to store the data. So what I have done is configured online archive for this collection. Oh, again, it sat too long. Nobody saw that, right? Nobody saw the sad cloud? Not me. No, no there it is. So I've set up the archive to work for three, every, you know, anything older than 365 days, anything older than a year is going to be automatically archived. Now I was able to set this up with just a few clicks and now Atlas takes care of the rest for me. I don't have to go in and run an archive script periodically. Atlas just takes care of it. And I like that because I like, I don't want to have to remember to do things, right? Okay. So Hi, before I'm I set Pat. up on the- I don't remember anything anyway. <laughs> You just let the tasks fall off. Eh, somebody else will figure it out at some point. Automation is a wonderful so, thing, right? For sure. So before I set up online archive, I had almost 500,000 records in this collection. So you can see we've got about 278,000 records now. Now what I wanna do is query this collection from the shell. So I'm clicking around a lot here, but what I wanna do, I'm getting to the connect to this cluster option. 
and I want to connect with the shell. And you can see down towards the bottom, we've got three different options for connecting. We can, oh, and it looks like they have moved it around since I tested this yesterday. So the first one is connecting to the cluster and the online archive. The second one is connecting to just the cluster. And the third one is connecting just to the online archive. So I went ahead and set up these connections ahead of time. But since they moved, I think these tabs are out of order. We're going to see what happens. So this first tab should be connected to the cluster and online archive together. The second tab is connected to the cluster. And the third one's connected just to the online archive. So first thing let's do, let's see if I've got them in order. I just want to check how many documents are in each. So I'm going to say db.saledrone2021. That's the name of my collection. I find everything in it and then count the number of documents. All right, so we've got 485,000. That's that's querying everything. Now let's go ahead and connect to just the cluster. That's our active data. I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm just gonna say db.saledrone. Helps if I type it right. Find everything and count them. There's our 278,000. That's what we just saw in Atlas a minute ago. And last one, this is our online archive. This is our older data. Count how many things are in here. We're good there, like about 207, right? Thousand? Yes. Oh, look at that. Good, good mental math. All right. Mars off so by like I, 600. That's okay. I'll let that go. So as you can see, we're able to pretty easily clear. Why are you laughing at me? You're going to like let it go. That's that's new with me. I'm I'm channeling my inner Elsa. OK. okay. So, I, you know, it's pretty easy to query whichever one you want. Right. You can query your cluster and online archive together. You can query just your cluster with your active data or your online archive with your cold data. All right. I'm going to I want to do one more thing with this demo. What I want to do is run an aggregation pipeline query in all three. And I'm not going to get into the details of, of what this query, how it works. Um, but basically what it's doing, this is the this is the aggregation pipeline. And it's going to group the documents together by month and then perform some calculations. So as you can see in this first one where we're on the cluster and online archive, we've got data going back from January 2020 all the way through May of this year. That's the latest data we have. I'm going to do the same thing in my cluster, this is my active data. And we've got our most recent data, right? We've got July 2020 through May 2021. And then last one, I'm going to run the same query again in the online archive. And this should be just my older data, which it is. So pretty cool. I just wanted to show you that it's possible to you know, easily run the queries. Even if it's archived, you can still query it um, really easily, which is nice. And it comes back pretty quick. Yeah, it was, I was impressed with how fast that came back. All right, that's enough demo for now. Um, but quick wrap up on OFISH. OFISH has a ton more features that I don't have time to show you, but it has both iOS and Android apps that have offline sync capability. So if you wanna watch the full demo and see all the features, check out the mongodb.live keynote from last year. Uh, which is available on YouTube. And speaking of MongoDB.Live, MongoDB.Live is coming up this, I think it's July 13th and 14th. Can that I, sounds right. Know. That sounds right. And we would love to see you there. It's our uh, flagship conference. We hold it every year. Um, it's virtual this year. So you can come, you can attend. I think tickets are free, right? Yeah. We're just making stuff up here. I think tickets are free. Uh, and we would love to see <laughs> if they you there. Not, so, they are now. <laughs> they are now. We will, so, so please join us there. Uh, one more thing about OFISH. OFISH is open source. So if you'd like to try out the app for yourself, read the docs, or contribute to the code base, you can visit wildaid.github.io. All right, Ken, back to you to bring us home All here. All right, we, we're running short on time, so we'll zip through our, our wrap up here. So Lauren kicked things off by discussing terms and concepts. She walked us all through how to model data in a relational database versus MongoDB, at least the very beginnings of, of some of that thought process. 
she explained how terms map from relational databases to MongoDB. And we really want you to remember those first three here in this chart, right? Rows map to documents, columns map to fields, and tables map to collections. And then from there, we kind of moved on to the data platform. And the data platform really kind of has, you know, three main components storing the data, whether that's self-managed Atlas, Atlas Data Lake, accessing the data in kind of a variety of ways, um, workload isolations, chain streams, using MQL, and processing the data with compass charts, BI connector, um, and things like the aggregation framework really make processing and accessing data really good. And then we did the amazing OFISH demo. Um, and there really wasn't anything too fishy about that this time. So nice work on that, Lauren. Um, and then we saw a sail drone and that really sailed along, uh, which was great. Um, so thank you all very much. I think that wraps up what we have planned for today. Um, feel free to join us in the MongoDB community, community.mongodb.com um, after this session. And there we go, off into our community forums. And we're in, in and out of there on you know various times. And there's a, a lot of other staff and community people that are more than happy to answer any MongoDB questions that you might have. Look, at, up at the top is a banner for MongoDB.live. We did get the dates right. So and we got the free, right? So you know we we're not going to get right. yelled at for uh, for giving away something for free. Yeah. So it's someone was asking. I already lost the comment. Someone asked if it's online. Yes, this year it is online. In years past, it's been in person, but it's online this year, so you can join us from anywhere around the world. And um, I know I'm going to be doing a session uh, all about CI/CD pipelines for Realm apps. And I built a whole pipeline using GitHub Actions. It was a lot of fun. I can't wait to share it with you guys. So um, definitely please register and join my session. Ken, are you doing a session this year? Is anybody from your team doing a session? Um, I don't think we're doing any sessions this year from, from our team, but we're kind of spattered around. And on the keynote, we have some folks doing stuff on the keynote. Um, and we're certainly going to be like moderating different groups and, and stuff. So we're, we're definitely going to be around. Awesome. So I think uh, Shiri has been rapid fire answering questions. And I think Nick has as well in the background. If Thank we you, Shiri it, and Nick. Yes. So much. Yes. Yes. Because it was, we love all the questions. It's hard to talk and answer questions at the same time. So we love having them here. If you have questions still, we can hang for a couple minutes. Uh, hey, so great to see you. I love people are here from around the world. Elbow bump. Can you do that virtually? Like, now, I'm, now I feel extra dorky. I did it though. It, it is so. amazing how international of an audience we we get. I mean, not just you and I, because we're we're both amazing and we you know draw a, a big crowd for all of our things. Um, but Obviously. just the uh, the internationalness of the community is pretty pretty great. Yeah. So it looks like uh, Tony's saying executes not working in Python. I don't know that we're going to be able to debug that here in person, but I think that is a great question for the community uh, because there you can go and you can say, here's what I'm trying to do. Here's, you know, here's what's happening. Here's the error message I'm getting. And um, I bet somebody on the community can help help get you started with that. All right. And um, while we're here, I got to plug my social because that's what I do. So uh, you can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, and TikTok. All of my links are available on my link tree. And um, I'm Lauren underscore Schaefer, just about everywhere you can find me. Ken, do you have anything you desperately need to plug? Um, check out MongoDB University for all, all the free courses on how to learn MongoDB. Um, but on personal social stuff, no. 
I don't do talk tick or snap book or face chat or whatever those things are. It's so lame. My typewriter yeah. doesn't connect to, to the Your social typewriter. platform. So it makes it a challenge. All right. I think I have a, a little bit of my understanding of what Ron Swanson, um, from what you described of him, I think I have a little bit of his blood flowing through me and some of those things. <laughs> you do have a bit of a Ron, a somewhat of a Ron vibe. All right. Uh, let's see. Salman is asking this question. Uh, Ken, I'm going to need your help on this one. So it says, I created one database using Flask SQL Alchemy for feedback. And if I deploy that website in Heroku, then if someone added the feedback and does, I'll be able to see that data in SQLite Viewer. Um, it's been a long time since I've used SQL Alchemy, specifically in Flask. Um, and I'm not... Uh, as versed anymore in, in the SQL light world. After being at MongoDB for three years, some of the, the SQL -y sorts of things. Um, but again, I think that's a great question um, for the community forums. Yes, agreed. So I accidentally left it up, but yes, go over to community.mongodb.com and there are uh, people who can probably help you out with that. All right. I think then that may be, well, I feel like you're setting us up for this one, Tony. Which is better, MySQL or MongoDB? I mean, what, <laughs> what do you think we're going to say here? <laughs> Obviously, we are going to say MongoDB. And there are a few advantages uh, to MongoDB, which, which I lay out in an article I wrote. Let's see if I can... I can find it for for you. Um, and I would agree with Tree's comment there that, you know, I think once you've used MongoDB for a little bit, um, so her comment was that she used Michael, MySQL for 18 years um, and wouldn't go back. Uh, I, I wouldn't go back either. Yeah, I think the That's flexibility you get. Thank you. Right at the, at the, right at the beginning of, of the pandemic world that came out. Yeah. Yeah. Strange times. Yeah. I think if you're coming from a relational database world, it is going to feel like a shift. You know, there is a little bit of a mindset shift to come to MongoDB. Um, but I think it's worth it. And once you get into it, it's it does feel very intuitive. Um so and the development process, in my experience, is just so much faster than. Yeah. Than, so, for me, that was, um, that was the deal breaker was just the amount of time that it took to develop, um, you know, prototype stuff in uh, a MySQL world or any sort of SQL environment versus MongoDB. It, you could just get up and running so much faster. Um, and yes, there's a learning curve to MongoDB, but there's also a learning curve to SQL. There's a learning curve to, I mean, if you're a Java developer and your boss comes and says, hey, we need this app written in Go, there's a learning curve there. I mean, so, I mean, it's in my mind, if you're not learning as a developer, you're, um, I don't know, probably falling behind. Yeah. All right, Ken, somebody is also setting you. Oh, that's not the one I wanted to click on. It moved. Someone's also setting you up with this one. For enrolling sure in your MongoDB course here, it's university.mongodb.com. Um, and there's a whole slew of different courses there. I would highly recommend if you're new to MongoDB, um, starting with the M001 Introduction to MongoDB course, it's a great place to start. Um, and you know, then kind of depending on your interest and, and what you're trying to do, you can progress through a whole slew of other courses there. And MongoDB University is actually how we train all of our technical employees internally. So like we really believe in the courses and they're they're very well done. And they're free. So and they're free. I mean, yeah. 
that ma that makes it even easier to get started. All right, maybe one last question here. Do you provide dummy data for practicing? Yes, we do. Uh, we if you, do, and it's, uh, it's really great. I'm sure you're going to um, have, yeah, so there's a load of sample data set there, um, and it has several different data sets in there. And the great thing is that the data sets are kind of set up um, to hit a variety of different kind of a document structure types and you know kind of schema designs, but also different applications. You know that you you might just, I mean they're not heavy heavy in in depth, but things like Airbnb data sets, um, shipwrecks, so you have some geospatial things. There's grade books. Um, oh, a, a movie database. I mean there's kind of all sorts of of things here, and I'm I know I'm forgetting some of them because there's uh, yeah. Uh, restaurants, supply store, um, all you know, all sorts of different things. Very cool. All right. And again, um, that's all I free. I, I mean, it, if you launch your Atlas cluster, um, which you can launch an Atlas cluster for free forever, and you can load the sample data sets in there, and then you can start examining and exploring and doing you know application development against those sample data sets just to kind of see how working with MongoDB works and whatnot. All right, I said it was gonna be the last question, but I lied. Uh, Solve Techie wants us to bring Among Us back to Twitch. We did that last year, we played, I think it was last year, we played Among Us on the stream. I'm sure the recording's available somewhere. Uh, can, can, let's see, since we know that you like uh, eight tracks and typewriters, do you know what Among Us is? I literally have zero idea. Okay, Among Us is very popular with the kids these days. Uh, at least it was earlier in the pandemic. It's a it's a silly little video game. You try and guess who the bad guy is. So maybe we'll play again. We'll have to that tell Nick who fun. coordinates everything. Yeah, I'd love to see you try to move around. Do you know my my husband makes fun of me because I don't know how to move around with the W A S D keys and I use the arrows and that slows me down. Do you know how to use the W A S D keys? Um, for mm -hmm. Minecraft only. Wait, Ken knows how to play Minecraft? Um, well, it's been a while, but um, my kids were really into it at one time, so we um, would play together, and that was our bonding experience for, I don't know, a while. Yeah, my daughter is obsessed with Minecraft. It's all she wants to do. She wants to watch Minecraft YouTube videos, like very into it so yes on that note all right um i think that's probably it for today do you have any final thoughts oh <laughs> thoughts no <laughs> all right i think that is all that's ambitious to have a today, then. all right well, it has been a pleasure streaming with you once again, Ken. And always a pleasure. Uh, yeah, friends who are watching, please don't forget to click like, subscribe, share, all those delightful things. The recording the, will be available all the shortly. That you're supposed to do. Yeah, you know what to do. Uh, the recording will be up shortly, and you can share that. Oh, sorry to everyone, I just knocked my microphone. I got too excited. But yeah, please share the recording with your friends. And we hope to see you again on the stream soon. Bye, share everybody. Share with your family, too. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Family and friends and enemies or coworkers or whoever. Share with everybody. Share with everybody. All right. Bye for Great real. Great to see you all. See Thank you all very much. And see you at .live. See you at dot live.